Well, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up at 10 a.m. Uh, so today, in the remaining two lectures, uh, I will talk about the following things. So first, uh, we'll finish the proofs for count sketch. I'll do a brief recap and finish the proofs. And uh, then I will move to what I promised at the very beginning of the lecture, namely to graph sketching, sort of the more recent stuff that has been happening over the past few years. We'll look at L0 samplers, uh, which is a primitive that will come up. Um, ah, OK. I need to insert my clicker. Good. OK, so this is the plan. So now let's go to count sketch and, uh, and the proofs. So we'll start with a recap uh, in case you don't quite remember what the setting was. The setting was the following. We're interested in solving the heavy hitters problem in data streams. So we, we, we get uh, as input a sequence of uh, capital N numbers, uh, I1, I2 through IN, like this. And as before, we are updating this frequency histogram. So we also think of this vector representation of the stream. And our task is to output the k most frequent items, approximately. So for example, here, if k is 1, then our task is to figure out that the item 3 appears in the stream most often. We want small storage uh, that is proportional to k and uh, only with weak logarithmic dependence on the size of the universe or the length of the stream. OK, so what we realized was that uh, in order to solve this uh, heavy hitters problem, it suffices to construct the following primitive. It was called approximate point query. What is approximate point query? It's this data structure that scans the stream, uses a small amount of space, and somehow after observing the stream, if we're given n element of the universe, which is 1 through m, little m is the universe size, then this, uh, this, uh, this approximate point query can tell us how many times item i arrived in the stream. Not exactly, but approximately. So that's why we call it fi hat. Good. And so this is the solution for approximate point query that we designed in the previous lecture. The solution was uh, as follows. <laughs> The primitive maintains uh, a table, a T by B table. Uh, there are T rows and B columns. The rows correspond to independent hashings of the universe of data items. The B columns correspond to buckets, and each bucket corresponds to a subsample stream. This is how this works. So we choose, at the, be at the beginning of this process, we just choose T random hash functions, H1, H2 through HT, that map our data items to B buckets. Think of B as being, say, 100K. And uh, also T random sign functions, because we're doing something similar to the AMS sketch. And then the algorithm was running these T independent copies of a very basic estimate. Uh, basically, whenever a point, uh, whenever a data item arrives, we check for each of the T hash functions, where does this data item hash? And um, each cell of the, each appropriate cell of the table is then updated with the sign function, with the random sign of that data item. Wonderful. So this means that every, uh, every bucket stores this basic estimate. And uh, then the estimator was just to return the median of the basic estimates. So the basic estimate was the sign, the sum of signs. Then we, we look at this cell of the hash table multiplied by the sign of the data item that we want to estimate, take the median of all these things uh, over the T. Uh, over the t hash functions. Good. So now let's. Uh, so I want to just remind you what the what the analysis or what the guarantees were, and then we'll look at the proofs. And uh, the guarantees. Uh, so, so first, first in the previous lecture we showed that uh, this this each cell of the hash table runs a certain basic estimator for the frequency of item i. We showed that this estimator was unbiased. So the expectation of our estimator was exactly f i. And furthermore, we analyzed the variance. We just got an exact expression for the variance. And the variance of our estimator, namely fi minus the estimator, the expectation of that squared. And this expectation is actually only over the sine functions, because our basic estimator didn't have any, hash, hash, any hashing in it. So the variance turned out to be exactly the sum over the entire universe of data items of the frequency of jth item squared. So the L2 squared norm of the other item. Good. And sort of the hope was that since we're hashing our universe of data items into B buckets, this sort of reduces the variance here by a factor of B. And that's what we'll make precise uh, in, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. 
Good. So the answer is yes, indeed, if we choose B large enough, then we'll reduce estimation error below uh, a certain threshold. And the threshold that we're interested in was epsilon, our precision parameter, times the frequency of the kth most frequent i. Good. So this was the specific uh, setting. Uh, what we showed is that there is a way to set parameters, namely to choose the number of hash functions, to buckets to hash into, so that good things happen. Namely, our estimator is correct up to an epsilon fraction of fk. Good. Good. Any, any questions about the setup? Or does everybody remember what, what this was? Good. So uh, now, since we'll look at the proofs, uh, let me again show you what the main punchline of count sketch was. And uh, this was the following, that sort of suppose that our data stream of items look, looks like this. There's uh, k free, uh, dominant items, uh, they're shown in green, and they're called the head of the stream. And uh, the rest is the tail, they're shown in red. So now, um, the following setting of parameters suffices. If we let the number of hash buckets be at least this ratio of the L2 squared mass in the tail divided by epsilon times fk squared, then uh, we get the right precision. And uh, the interesting part was uh, basically that one can think of the tail as, uh, giving, uh, as, as being noise in our estimates. And you think of the total L2 squared mass in the tail of the, on the tail of the signal, and you spread it sort of evenly among the top k coefficients about, over the head, and that's the amount of noise that we get in our estimates. This is the intuition. So in particular, as I showed before, the surprising part is that if we have this data stream where let's say k equals one, so there's like a, a single item that appears root n times, uh, and uh, everybody else appears once, then we can figure out the identity of this item in uh, constant space. Which is surprising because if you just keep sampling the stream, uh, you will never see it unless you sample root n elements. <coughs> okay, good. So now let's just prove, uh, prove the guarantees. So this is a quick, uh, quick summary. We, we got the count sketch algorithm and uh, this was this find approximate top uh, data structure uh, that was returning the top k elements approximately. This was based on approximate point query. Good, so the proof details. So now again, we are looking at, uh, so here's our algorithm at the top of the, at the, top of the page. And uh, what we want to understand is, is the following. So let's, uh, let's now look at one row of the hash table. So one hash function h. And we know that uh, we're running, and think of one fixed uh, item, i. And we know that we have a basic estimator that is uh, unbiased, and the variance is exactly the sum of squares of fj uh, of other frequencies that hash into the same bucket. So what we want to show is that the variance reduces by about a factor of b, but actually we want more. Because uh, recall that in the setting of parameters, uh, we were setting the number of buckets to be the ratio of the sum of squares of frequencies in the tail end of the signal only, divided by the head. So it's not actually enough to show that you know, this variance for a random hash function reduces by about a factor of b. What we want to show that this is that this variance is actually governed by the tail of the signal. Sort of the top k coefficients actually don't influence our est estimates in a way. So this is, this is a very important point. Um, Good. And so to get, this, uh, to get this kind of behavior, what we would like to do is split this variance term into two parts. So let's just consider separately two terms. One is the contribution of the head of the signal to the variance, and the other is the contribution of the tail of the signal to the variance. So we're looking at uh, the summation of fj squared over all data items j that hash into the same bucket as i. So in particular, this is over j in the head, the, t the top k dominant guys, and in the tail. So note that these two sums are pretty different. The first sum has only k elements in it. They could be pretty large, because they're in the head, but uh, there are a few elements. The second sum uh, has many, many elements, but generally we think of it as small. And that's why we'll handle them differently. Good. So this is how we'll prove the result. What it will show, basically, that with constant probability over the choice of the hash functions, this first term will be identically zero. Namely, if we only look at the contribution of the head elements to the variance of our estimate, and with constant probability is zero, well, why is that? This is because we only had k head elements, 
and we hashed into, say, 100k buckets. So with probability 99, uh, 99 over 100 or so, uh, our element i doesn't even collide with a single head element. So sort of this, this term with pretty good probability will be identically zero. And the other term is, is not, sort of does not have this stochastic behavior. We'll need to use Markov's inequality on it. So formally, this is what we'll do. So let r be an index between 1 and t. This is just one of the rows of our, uh, our table that we're storing, one of the hash functions. And let's fix i, the data item that we're trying to estimate. We'll define three, uh, three events, and we'll show that these are the good events, and we'll show that they happen with pretty good probability. These are the events. So first, no collisions event. Uh, it depends on i, and it also depends on this parameter r, which of the hash function it occurs for. And this no collision event says that, oh, this event occurs when our data item i does not collide with any of the head items under hashing r. And because we're hashing into 100k buckets, this will happen pretty often. Good. So this will let us control the first term. Then the second event is the small variance event. Again, depends on i and depends on r. Well, this is the event that basically the second term is not much more than a 1 over b fraction of the sum over the entire universe. This is some kind of Markov's inequality. And finally, uh, there is a small deviation event, which is this good event by Chebyshev, that occurs by Chebyshev's inequality in the basic analysis. So what we'll show is that all these three events hold simultaneously with probability strictly big, better than two by some constant margin. And because of that, if we take, uh, if we take log n repetitions and take the median estimate, the median will be good with high probability. That, that's the logic. Any, any questions on, on, on the grand plan? All right, good. So again, what is the no collisions event? It's the event that our data item i, which we now think of as fixed, does not collide with any head element, except for itself, if it is a head element, uh, under hashing i. What is the probability that that happens? Well, if our hash function is pairwise independent, uh, or, or even universal, that, that would suffice. Uh, what we know is that for every pair of distinct elements i and j, the probability that i and j collide is at most one, of the no one over the number of buckets that we hash into. Okay. Now, remember, in the setting of parameters, we had two terms, and in particular, we wanted the number of buckets to at least be 8k. Uh, I've been saying 100k, but 8 actually suffices. Well, then item i collides with item j in the head of the signal with probability at most 1 over b, and there are k elements in the head of the signal. So by a union bound, the probability of colliding uh, with at least one of them is at most k over b. So the, the no collisions event happens with probability at least 1 minus k over b, which is at least 1 minus uh, 1 over 8. Questions, concerns? All right, good. Uh, so this, this takes care of this first event, right? So we're still trying to analyze this uh, variance term. And this takes care of the first event. Let's take care of the second event, which is the small variance event. OK, so the small variance event, again, i is fixed and r is fixed. It's the following thing. It, it takes a little bit of time to parse. But this says that if I sum up uh, uh, the frequency squared over all items j in the tail of the signal, except for i, that also hashed into the same bucket as i, then I will get at most 8 over the number of buckets that I hashed into times the, the, the L2 squared mass in the entire tail of the stream. Well, this just, no. the fact that this event happens with probability at least 1 minus 1 over 8 simply by Markov. And let's, let's see why this is true. Well, again, uh, for every i and j that are distinct, the probability that they collide in a bucket if h is pairwise independent is 1 over b. And if it's universal, it's at most 1. So by linearity of expectation, uh, if we sum the expectation of this left-hand side um, is what? Uh, we sum over all j in the tail, f, uh, j, frequency of j squared times the probability that j collides with i, which is exactly the L2 squared norm in the tail. Uh, divided by b. So in expectation, 
this is what we get. So by Markov's inequality, uh, the probability that a random variable, which is non-negative and has expectation mu, uh, is higher than eight times mu is at most one over eight. So by Markov, the small variance event happens with probability at least one minus one over eight for each i and for each hashing r. Okay, good. So this is already pretty nice because what we just showed is that, see, so, so by our basic estimate analysis, we knew that the variance was exactly the sum of fj squared over all items j that hash into the same place as i. Well, conditioned on no collisions and on small variance, we have indeed that the first term is zero and the second term is pretty small. It's one over b, uh, eight over b times this L2 squared norm of the tail. So we're almost done, because the last piece that we need is, uh, is a small deviation event. So sort of note that all this analysis right now uh, was uh, when we were taking expectation, we were taking expectations only over the hash functions h, right? Because sort of once you fix the hash functions, then uh, you get a, a specific substream of the original stream and you run the basic estimate on it, and that basic estimate depend, depends on the random signs. So now finally we're just saying, okay, so now with high probability over the choice of the hash functions, the variance of the basic estimate will be pretty small. So now we'll, we'll, we'll call, we'll, we'll use the results from previous lecture. Okay, so the small deviation event is the event that, uh, is the event that uh, our estimate for fi, which is the sine of i times whatever was in this uh, cell of the hash table squared, is at most the variance of the corresponding estimate. Now by Chebyshev, this, uh, this happens with, probabi with probability at least one minus one over eight. Uh, actually, even higher, one minus one over 64, that's what we did last time, but we don't need this, so we'll just use one over eight. Okay, so we had three events, small variance, no collisions, uh, and uh, small deviation. The first two depend on the hash functions only, and each one happens with probability at least seven eighths. Uh, so by a union, and, and the last one depends on the, on the random signs. So by a union bound, all three of these events happen with probability at least 5 over 8. And now, uh, standard uh, median analysis gives us that uh, if we, uh, if we, uh, if we, right. Uh, and now if we take a logarithmic number of repetitions of our independent estimate, which is exactly what the logarithmic number of rows of the hash table are doing, uh, we'll get that uh, the median is this, uh, this close, uh, is eight gamma close for this definition of gamma uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the actual true answer with high probability. I will not do the proof, this is by Chernoff bounds. So you take logarithmic number of uh, repetitions, the probability that the, uh, each uh, individual estimator fails is less, than a, is less than a half, so it's highly unlikely that the median estimator will be wrong. Okay, good. And uh, there are some details, uh, as in, for example, note that for our application, we need these guarantees uh, to hold at every point in the stream. Because remember, we're using a proximate point query, not at the end of the stream, but whenever an item arrives, we need it, a we need it, uh, we need it to be correct uh, upon every arrival. So there are some details needed, uh, small details needed in setting the failure probabilities. Okay. So let me not uh, spend time on this. Okay, good. And uh, so, so th this is, uh, this is the, the proof, really, uh, because uh, now, if we want to get to the original bound, which was this uh, uh, huge expression that said that our b uh, needs to be at least 8k uh, and larger than 32 of the sum of squares of the tail, uh, of the elements in the tail, divided by epsilon times uh, f, uh, fk squared, uh, the way we get it is by plugging into the previous analysis. So recall that we needed this condition that the number of buckets is at least 8k. That's to ensure that we don't collide with the head elements most of the time. So this is exactly what this first term is doing here. Uh, and then the second term uh, is, just, uh, is just solving for, for gamma. So basically we want, from the previous slide, we have that the median is 8 gamma close uh, to the true answer with high probability, uh, uh, w with high probability, and uh, now we need to choose b to make this uh, eight gamma equal to epsilon fk. 
just substitute for gamma and, uh, and this works out. Any questions? All right, good. So then uh, at, at this point, uh, I, we're, we're done with count sketch. Let me recap. So what is this? Uh, this is a linear primitive that allows us to compress a data stream uh, into, into a hash table, or rather a sequence of independent hash tables. And uh, this linear, a uh, note that this is all linear operations. And this allows us to approximate, approximate the frequency, the frequencies with which various items uh, occurred in the stream. The primitive is linear, which is very nice, because, for example, now, if your data set, for instance, does not just arrive in a stream, but uh, actually maybe you have several streams or your data set is stored across several machines, then what you can do is you can apply a count sketch locally on every machine, and then by linearity, uh, just add them together. So th these linear sketches are also very useful for distributed computation. Okay, good. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, so the question is, if I understand correctly, you're saying uh, for the heavy hitters problem, we have a K in mind, which is our budget, sort of how much space I have, and then we're recovering whatever we can under this budget, right? Uh, I see you're saying, can you, can you I see, so presumably the question is, given a data stream, can I figure out what is the smallest K that works? If, what is the smallest K such that the data stream has sort of K heavy hitters in some form? Yes, yeah, I see. Um, yeah, I see. So this is a testing. This is a testing problem. Um, let me see. So generally, this is a question of testing. So suppose I have a K in mind, uh, and then uh, I want to know: Is it true that my data stream? Um, uh, is it true that my data stream contains k heavy hitters, or at most k heavy hitters, and the rest can be viewed as noise? So in the L2 squared sense, sort of the tail is sort of small in comparison to the head. Uh, this is something you can uh, do more efficiently than k log n space, I believe. I'm, I'm, yeah, so I think it's a k times poly 1 over epsilon. Uh, I'm not sure if it's written up uh, anywhere, except in some work that have been, we have been doing recently, but it's not uh, public. But, uh, so, yeah. Generally, you can shave off, uh, it's easier. So you don't need the log, log n factor. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can take it off. Other questions? Good. Uh, in that case, uh, I would like to switch gears and uh, go to graph sketching and graph streaming. And uh, the goal uh, will be to see how these basic statistical primitives from the classical streaming literature apply to analyzing graphs. And uh, for that, I, I need to first introduce the graph streaming model of computation because it is slightly different. There are some settings of parameters that are interesting. So what is the graph streaming model? So we think of our input as being a graph. So it's a graph on n vertices and m edges. And we think of the vertices of the graph as being known. So maybe the vertices are numbers between 1 and n, or you know their identities. And uh, these are the green dots on the slide. And then the edges of the graph arrive in some order in a stream like this. And uh, the algorithm needs to look at the stream and at the end of the day output the answer. So now, of course, the catch is that the graph might have many edges. And uh, the algorithm cannot just store the entire graph and uh, solve the problem uh, offline. So the catch is that in the graph streaming model of computation, we think of the algorithm as being able to use only O tilde n space, so n poly log n space. So there are n vertices, m edges, and n poly log n space. So the number of edges could naturally be up to m squared. So we need to do some kind of compression on the graph. So think of being able to store, say, a few spanning trees or, or, or so. But in general, we don't want to make any assumptions on what we store. It's just n polylog n bits. And uh, sort of one could think of the algorithm as making several passes over the stream. But again, ideally, we want single pass algorithms, so, so sort of oblivious compression schemes, like the ones that we have uh, seen before. Good. 
And so in the picture that I just showed, uh, edges were only added to the graph. So this is known as an insertion stream. But we will look at deletion streams as well. OK. So I would like to ask a very simple question. So suppose that this is my model. I have a graph with uh, n vertices. Uh, I have n poly log n space. And now just edges of a graph are given to me one after another. I get a single pass. I want to construct a spanning tree of the graph. How would you do that? Yeah, yeah you, you do the trivial thing. Thank you. Yeah. So if uh, we have, uh, it, it's very easy in insertion only streams because I'll just maintain a spanning tree. And whenever an edge comes in, I'll just check um, uh, if it connects two components, that I, th then I'll add it. Otherwise, I'll discard it. Here's a picture to go along with this. So this is uh, the edges coming in. And uh, I take the edge if it becomes red. So for example, this edge comes in, it closes a triangle, so that's not so interesting. This edge is not interesting, this edge is interesting, and uh, we have a spanning tree. We did not uh, take the black edges. Good. So this is a very easy problem in insertion-only streams. But now, uh, suppose that we're analyzing some network that evolves over time. So some edges uh, come in, and sometimes edges depart. So now you can get insertions and deletions of edges. And now this becomes a much harder problem. Let me convince you that this is a much harder problem, and it's quite surprising that you can solve it uh, using a small amount of space. So suppose that this is our graph. So suppose that we have a, uh, a stream with insertions and deletions, and at some point, we are presented with this graph. So look at this edge here, the red edge. This is the single edge that crosses a cut in the graph. So this edge is extremely important. If we don't take it, then we can't construct a spanning tree. OK, excellent. On the other hand, uh, so we have an insertion and deletion stream. So the following could happen in the, in the graph. So suppose I go and I give you, give the algorithm, many, many more edges that cross the very same cut, like this. So now at this point in the stream, this red edge is no longer important. There is no reason to believe that that edge is important and others are not. OK, but I have a deletion stream. So in the next, uh, in the next point, at uh, the next point in time, I can just remove all these extra edges that I added. And now my favorite red edge is, uh, is very important again. So if I want to design a small space algorithm that constructs a spanning tree of the graph, this has to be a very different type of algorithm. Because in insertion streams, you just look at an edge, you, you add it to your tree. You know, if it connects, you add it to the forest that you're maintaining. If it connects some components, then you take it, otherwise you don't. And now in this case, if you take an edge, later it could be deleted, and you've already forgotten about some other edges that may be important. But you're looking only for, for spanning tree, not spanning for the scale. Spanning, oh, uh, spanning tree, I, I see, so, good. Uh, I want, uh, I want to construct, a, uh, really, I want to construct a spanning forest of the graph. And if the graph is not connected, then the, the solution we'll present will actually construct a uh, forest. But uh, I don't know, spanning trees are hard. I think, I, I, I don't really see the, um, no. How would you construct spanning trees then with deletions? I think they're easier than forests for some no, reason? No, no, I just uh, imagine that this is, uh, this is very important. Uh -huh. Right. But in this case, you also need the spanning forest as an aspect. I see. OK, so the, the only thing that I want to say is that those deletion streams are hard. And they're hard exactly for this, uh, for this purpose, that it's, uh, for this reason that it's not clear. We have to do some compression of the graph, but it's not clear how you compress. Because edges that appear very important at one point in the time might, might appear absolutely unimportant uh, at the next stage. And they could be important again uh, later. OK, good. So very different algorithms are needed. And uh, because of that, we will use uh, sketching algorithms. Uh -huh. So here's the main, uh, the main idea in graph sketching. So this was introduced in 2012 uh, in a very influential paper of Anguch and McGregor. The idea is to apply classical sketching techniques on the edge incidence matrix of the graph. So Basically, we will design, uh, design algorithms that perform compression into n poly log n space, such that from this compressed representation, we can recover a spanning tree. And this compressed rep representation can be maintained in dynamic streams. Well, we don't have too many techniques for dealing with dynamic streams. 
And uh, linear sketching, which we have been talking about for the past two lectures, is a technique that naturally applies to dynamic streams. Because if I do linear sketching, I can subtract edges as easily as I can add them, just by linearity. OK, good. So the, the way these algorithms will work is as follows. So let me first define the edge incidence matrix of the graph. Well, here's a graph on the left, and here's the edge incidence matrix. So this edge incidence matrix is a matrix that has n choose two rows. So each row of the matrix is a potential edge. Not all edges are in the graph, so some of the rows are zero. So for example, this row is zero because it corresponds to some pair UV that is a non-edge in the graph. Uh, OK, and uh, there are n columns. So the columns of this matrix correspond to uh, vertices of the graph. And uh, you have seen a lot uh, of this matrix in uh, Alexandra's lectures. So our graph is underrated, right? Yes. And I will put 1 and minus 1 randomly? Great question. So the question was, the graph is undirected, but how come uh, vertices uh, UV are treated differently? Uh, because uh, each edge, uh, sort of each edge corresponds to a row, and in the row we have 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. How do we choose which one? The answer is arbitrarily. It will not matter for the algorithm. Okay. Good. So rows of this, uh, rows of this matrix correspond to uh, edges. So for example, this, is a, this orange edge, say, corresponds to this row. And there is 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. It is crucial that we'll have a 1 and a minus 1. They will give uh, very important cancellations. OK. Good. So note, for example, that, uh, note, for example, that uh, B transpose B is the Laplacian of the graph. OK, good. So here's the main, uh, any questions about what this matrix is? So here's the main property of this matrix that we'll crucially use in our algorithm. And uh, the property is that this matrix encodes information about, sort of very naturally encodes information about the cuts in the graph. So indeed, we're looking for a spanning forest or a spanning tree in the graph. And uh, what is a spanning tree? This is really a subgraph that ensures that whichever cut in the graph was non-empty is non-empty in the subgraph. So we need to understand how cuts work. So the property that we'll use is the following. So suppose that B is our edge incidence matrix, shown here. This is our graph. Suppose that I now have a set subset S of vertices, and I'm interested in the set of edges that cross the cut. That is, uh, go from S to the complement of S in the graph. So here on the picture, uh, there's this uh, red line that cuts the graph into two pieces. And uh, the set S is, say, the bottom half. So delta of S is the set of edges that cross the cut. So now the crucial property of the edge incidence matrix that we will use is the following. Suppose that uh, let X, which is a vector in dimension N, be the indicator vector of the set S of our cut. So X is shown here. Uh, X has ones on one side of the cut and zeros on the other side of the cut. I claim that the matrix vector product B times X is the signed indicator of the, um, of the edges that cross the cut. Now this is a very important point. Let me give an example, perhaps. Mm. <coughs> Do we have an eraser? Why are crossing, huh? why are crossing edges cut the same sign? They don't. So, so but that's it's not the actual radius, radius. So uh, the claim is that yeah, good. So the claim is that b times x is a, is a vector of dimension n choose two. Uh, it has zeros uh, everywhere except the edges that cross the cut, and the sign. I don't know what the sign was. It depended. It depends on the orientation of the original edges. Do we have a way to? You read these things. Oh, it's okay, actually, I have enough space. Yeah. Good. And so let's just maybe do a very simple example. So suppose I have a triangle, uh, ABC, and the edge incidence uh, matrix of this triangle will be, uh, will be what? Uh, will be, say, minus 1, 1. This is for B and C. This is a 0. This is this edge. Uh, a and B, let's say, is 1, minus 1, and 0. A and C is perhaps 1, 
0 and minus 1. So now, if, uh, so this is my matrix B. So now if I'm interested in the cut, let's say separates uh, BC from A, then what I do is just I look at the indicator vector of this cut, which is, uh, which is what? Which is say 0, 1, and 1. So this means that what I will do uh, is I will just add up, I will add up the, uh, the columns of the matrix B that correspond to uh, B and C. So what I get is, uh, is a vector. Mm, so I get minus 1 and 1. Uh, that corresponds to the edge from B to C, and it cancels. So all the edges that, that are inside the cut, they cleanly cancel. Uh, so uh, good. And then I get minus 1. So this is, this is a 0. I get minus 1. This is for the edge that connects mm, B to A. This edge crosses the cut, so that's exactly what I wanted. And I get a... Uh, I get a minus one for the edge uh, C and A. Okay, good. So this cancellation property is, is, is very important for, for, for the application. All right, any uh, questions, concerns? Good. So now given this technique, uh, let me give you uh, an algorithm for a sketching type algorithm that uh, constructs a spanning tree or a spanning forest in the graph. And uh, for that, we will start with a very simple uh, <laughs> algorithm for connectivity. Our algorithm for connectivity will do the following. Well, suppose that this is our graph, and uh, we want to construct a spanning tree of the graph. In general, this will only also nicely construct uh, spanning forests. So here's what we do. Uh, it will be an iterative algorithm and uh, we'll uh, end up constructing a spanning forest, so that's why we call it F, and uh, it will be an iterative algorithm, and that's why these Fs have uh, superscripts. Good, so we start with our initial spanning forest as being empty, so F0 is empty, and uh, at every point in time, we'll maintain a set of connected components in the graph. So we'll start with C0 being the set of vertices. So imagine this is just a set of connected components. Initially, every vertex is a connected component uh, on its own. Okay. So now our algorithm proceeds over T rounds, capital T rounds, and capital T will be order log n. So it's, it's fairly quick. In each round, our algorithm does the following. So we look at each connected component U in the current graph. So a connected component is just a subset of vertices. Uh, and we select an edge that goes out of this connected component somehow. This is an offline algorithm. This is not a streaming algorithm yet. Well, this gives us a set of, uh, set of edges that we selected in round t. Um, and uh, we let ft plus 1 uh, be the forest ft plus these selected edges. And we let ct plus 1 be the new set of components. So we start with all vertices being singletons, and then in every round we have a set of connected component. components. Every connected component selects one outgoing edge. Uh, this connects some components and we proceed. So here's, here's how it works. So initially every vertex is a connected component by itself. It selects one edge, mm, so we'll denote this by an outgoing, uh, outgoing edge. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this vertex selected this one, and this one selected this one, and the same here, but uh, the picture could be a bit different. So they don't necessarily do matchings. Okay, so this is the first round. Uh, then this gives us a new set of connected components. So the top uh, four vertices are now connected together. Uh, then there is a connected component of size 2 here and a connected component of size 2 here. Uh, I'll, I choose a subforest in the edges that I selected. Uh, and now I'm thinking of my graph as a graph on supernodes. I have three supernodes at this point. And I repeat the same thing, except every supernode now selects one outgoing edge. Not every individual node, but every supernode. So these are the red edges that were selected in the next round. And again, I choose some of them. Uh, to be in my final spanning tree. Check some niche. Can you tell me, so do you really update CT plus 1 and FT plus 1 in the inner hole? 
We could do it, uh, yeah, actually we shouldn't have done it here. Yeah, the, uh, the for loop is, uh, move, move it two lines up. Yeah. The, the for loop goes, uh, actually should end here, and then once you selected all the edges, you update the case. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? Okay, can somebody give me a quick proof that this uh, constructs a spanning tree of the graph uh, in order log n rounds? So, like, how many times do I need to run it for? Why, why is setting t equals order log n sufficient? What do we what do we double? <laughs> what do we half? So you can see that at every iteration you half the number of connected components, at least. Okay, good. All right. Well, so here's, uh, here's what I would like to say then. No, I want to implement this procedure uh, using linear sketches. And uh, the, main, the, main, the main part of this procedure was doing what? Well, we had a connected component, um, connected component U in CT, right? Uh, and what we needed to do was to choose one edge. So basically, we have a connected component, which is a set of nodes. And all we needed to do was choose one edge from the cut. We needed to choose one edge from the graph that connects the nodes in this connected component to, to, to other vertices in the graph. Well, by the previous discussion, this is the same thing as taking the edge incidence matrix B, multiplying it on the right by the indicator of our connected component. So think of just adding up the columns of the matrix B. And then sampling, so now we get, one, we get a vector of size n choose 2. What we need is just choose one non-zero from that vector that gives us an edge. And now this is exactly the reason why uh, connectivity uh, can be solved uh, using, using linear sketches. Any questions on this? You're saying that for the path it's linear? No, not really. No, right, because if you run it on a path, you'll basically get sort of segments, uh, segments of exponentially growing length, right? Okay. Yeah, so just uh, sort of think of, um, so it's easy to see that the number of connected components at most, uh, you know, at, at least halves in every iteration. Um, how, how do you see this? Uh, well, uh, how do you see this? Uh, you write a small equation and you see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But for a path, right, so what will happen is that in, like, in the first round, say, if one way you know, this algorithm will work is that in the first round, every node chooses one, one neighbor, right? And uh, what is the worst case that can happen? Say, every even node, say, chooses the, odd, the neighbor to the, to the right, and every odd no node chooses the, the neighbor to the left. And so that way, uh, the number of connected components just sort of halves. Uh, if they suddenly, by some fluke, sort of stroke of luck, uh, get synchronized and everybody chooses their neighbor on the same side, then you actually are done in one round. So that's even faster. Uh, so the, and for, the first, for the first round, the worst that will happen is that uh, they just pair up. And then you pair up the pairs in the next round, right? So just the, sort of think of the length of your path as halving at every step. Can you repeat the arguments about sample n and z? Uh huh. Good. Uh, so here, if you look at this algorithm, then the main procedure in this algorithm is I have a connected component, and I want to select an edge that crosses the cut. Now I want to design a linear sketching algorithm that does the same thing. So and before I told you that uh, we will crucially use the edge incidence matrix of the graph. Good. So now I have a connected component U, and I want to select one edge that connects this connected component to the outside. So your graph is stored somehow, right? You have yeah, this is an offline algorithm, right? This is an offline algorithm has nothing to do with streaming. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah but, but I mean the, the streaming version. Oh, no, 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 I haven't defined it yet. Oh, okay. I haven't defined it yet. All I'm saying is that we need a primitive that will sample. Like if, I, if I had some magical oracle, 
that uh, I give it a connected component, I give it a subset of vertices, and it gives me an edge that crosses the cut, then I'm, I'm good. So what I will need to do is, uh, agreed? So this is by this observation that if I take the uh, edge instance matrix and I multiply it on the right by the indicator of my cut, then I get all the edges that cross it. Right. Good. Good, so this is what I need. Well, luckily, this is something that has been s s studied in the literature, and uh, we'll see roughly how this goes. Uh, but uh, this is known as an L0 sampler. And uh, there's, there are various definitions of L0 samplers. Let me give you one of them. Uh, a delta error L0 sampler is the following beast. We have a linear sketch S that compresses vectors of length n to some small dimension m. The sketch comes with a decoding primitive that takes the compressed vector of length m and spits out an element of n. What is it trying to do? Well, this uh, L0 sampler, the decoding primitive, doesn't spit out some arbitrary element of n, but rather it spits out a uniformly random element of the support of x. So if you let j be the result of decoding s times x, then the distribution of j is close in statistical distance to the uniform distribution on the support of x. And if you haven't seen total variation distance before, don't worry about this too much at, the, at this point. Just think of this algorithm that fails with probability delta at most. Uh, fails means that either gives up and tells you I don't know, or just gives you some garbage without even telling you that this is garbage. Uh, and if this failure event didn't happen, and we can set this failure event to be pretty small, uh, pretty unlikely, uh, then you just get a uniformly random sample from the support of your vector x. And so this is interesting, right, because uh, I could have a vector x with huge support, maybe linear support, but uh, I will be able to design this L0 sampler with a very small m. So it will compress uh, my, uh, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk about them precisely later, but I will, I will have m, so the claim is that m can be chosen to be polylogarithmic polylogarithmic in n, say, if I want 1 over poly n failure probability. So in the literature, and there has been uh, quite a lot of uh, work on this, and uh, the optimal results in the space complexity of, uh, of these algorithms are actually from just a couple of months ago, you can get this uh, m, the target dimension, to be only polylogarithmic. So if you want a single sample, of your vector, and you can compress huge, huge vectors of dimension n into a polylogarithmic number of coordinates and then decode. Okay, but this is exactly what we needed. So for this algorithm, our main primitive, uh, and you should really think of this for loop as being moved, uh, moved here, so we sort of we sample all the edges first and then we connect, uh, connect the components. Our main primitive is to select an edge out of every cut. So here's what we will do. Uh, note that our algorithm runs for a logarithmic number of steps. What we will do is we'll prepare a logarithmic number L0 samplers. We'll have these L0 samplers that will compress. So note that our L0 samplers, Sj, they will go from R n choose 2 to R R poly log n. So we'll prepare these L0 samplers, and we will store Sj times B. We'll keep compressed versions of the edge incidence matrix. S, S1 times B, S2 times B, ST times B. And so the point is that the matrix B had n choose two rows and n columns. But we're multiplying it by this L0 sampler on the left, so the L0 sampler collapses the n choose 2 dimension down to polylogarithmic. So each of these matrices, S1 times B, S2 times B, they're very small. So this is in dimension poly log n by n. So now every vertex stores a polylogarithmic number of numbers, right? Because even matrix vector multiplication is, uh, works, uh, works like this. You just take the columns of B and you multiply each column. By, uh, by, this, uh, by this matrix S. 
And this is it. Uh, this gives us a, an algorithm for uh, dynamic connectivity that compresses a graph with any number of edges down to n poly log n space because sj times b is a poly log n by n matrix. And then we can run, uh, run, the, run the decoding. Right. Yes, exactly. So, what, uh, uh, so the point is that we cru we're crucially using linearity. This is a very surprising algorithm because note that the algorithm is adaptive. So when we prepare the sketches, we don't know which connected components we will need to sample edges from. So in fact, the algorithm is a log t round algorithm. So, for example, if I, you know, if I, if I wanted to design a log, uh, sort of a log n round algorithm for dynamic connectivity, it would be much, much easier. But this is a single pass algorithm for dynamic connectivity. So we first maintain the sketches. We compute S1 times B, S2 times B, da, da, da. And then, because the edge incidence matrix uh, B has this nice property that if I, uh, if I, if I want the sketch, if, if, I want to, uh, if I want to look at the vector of uh, the indicate, assigned indicator vector of a cut, I just add up the columns of B, and our sketches are linear, we, we, can, uh, we can get, a, get an edge out of every, every cut, right? Because we stored S times B, uh, we just write multiplied by the indicator of U. So this is the same, uh, you know, the same as first looking at B and multiplying it by the indicator of U, and then sketching the result. So because of this magical composability of, uh, of sketches, uh, we get the algorithm. OK. So one, uh, one question. Why did we need t sketches? So here I said that you know, we're, we're running for t steps, and we'll prepare t sketches. Uh, why couldn't I have used one sketch s? It's a so somewhat subtle point. Uh, but uh, this comes from the following. Uh, the guarantee of uh, L0 samplers uh, is, uh, comes in the following form. You prepare the sketch, and then for every fixed x with high probability, you get a sample. Uh, on the other hand, if we were to use one, uh, one sketch s multiple times, then the actual vector, when I use the sketch first, this dictates the trajectory of the algorithm. And in particular, this means that the output of my sketch will influence the cuts that I will try to reconstruct later. And this introduces adaptivity. And adaptivity is not covered by the guarantees. Uh, it is actually false. So you can't, so it is crucial here that the randomness of your sketch is independent of the vector that you run it on. And if you were to use the same sketch over and over again, this would be false. Uh, and that this wouldn't be covered by the guarantees. And indeed, uh, it seems highly unlikely because uh, the sketch says that, oh, uh, I will take a, a vector of length n with potentially huge support, and I will let you sample one element out of it. The sketch is linear, so if adaptivity were not a problem, then I could just take the sketch, recover one element, subtract it from the sketch, recover another, and do this until I recover the entire x. But this was a compression from dimension n to dimension poly log n, so that's clearly impossible. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Do you have errors in, in that function that is extracting the, the edge from the, from the graph? Ah, great. Uh, the question is, uh, this function that extracts the edge from the graph, does it sometimes make errors? The answer is yes. This is exactly why this is called a delta error L0 sampler, because if something goes wrong, so it's based on hashing, and say if something goes wrong with your hash function, then maybe you will uh, output an edge that was not even present in the graph in the first place. We can drive down the probability of this to, to be small, and this costs us space. And uh, at the moment, we know exactly how much space you need to drive down this probability to... Yeah. Good. So basically, for this application, one can think of just setting the failure probability to be 1 over n to the 10, because I wasn't stressing polylogs much. Uh, and then by some union bound, you're saying that this, this runs for polynomial for most n rounds or so. Uh, so the probability that you'll fail ever 
is uh, inverse polynomially small. Okay, good. So this is, uh, this is very interesting and uh, also motivates this question of which other graph uh, problems admit sketching solutions. And in the next lecture, we'll see one other uh, such graph problem, which is a spectral sparsification. So spanning trees basically give you the guarantee that I take a graph, I compress it down to some uh, n poly log n space, and I can recover a spanning tree, which means that whichever cut I look at, if the cut was uh, non-empty in the graph, it will be non-empty in the spanning tree. Uh, and uh, spectral sparsifiers will give us a, a very uh, sort of a, a strengthening a very significant strengthening of this guarantee. So we'll approximate graphs uh, much better. Okay, uh, I don't have time to get into designing L0 samplers, but let me just perhaps leave it uh, up uh, on, on my web page if you want to take a look at some of the details. Okay, thanks.